Joshua Mike, who will be uh, giving a topic called Multi Scale Geometric Data Analysis via Laplace and Eigenvector Cascading. Great. I actually want to thank Stefania for speaking about Laplace and yeah. Eigenvectors because that's a really great uh, run up to my talk. All right, so uh, as mentioned, I'm going to talk about multi scale geometric data analysis. We're going to use Laplacian eigenvectors to do this. Uh, and similarly to before, we're going to be focusing on um, eigenvalues that are small when we do this. All right, so the kind of general goal here is just to understand uh, the geometry of the data set that we're given. And we want to understand it at different scales. Okay, so how we build our Laplacian will change the scale. Um, we're going to use Laplacian eigenvectors to do this. Uh, we do this because Laplacian eigenvectors uh, capture maximally smooth functions, and I'll talk a little bit about how you define that formally. Uh, and as mentioned, they separate out weakly connected components, right? Things that have maybe a narrow bridge between them or maybe very low density uh, data between dense clusters, right? Um, so why would we want to do this? Well, Laplacians are great and they reveal a lot of information, but you get different information as you change the scale. So specifically, I mean varying the bandwidth, uh, which is something that's been studied a lot, in fact, convergence with varying the bandwidth, but also varying the subsets of a data set. Okay, so I'm going to be taking different subsets of a major data set. Okay. Uh, and there's kind of two problems we want to tackle uh, with what I'm talking about here. Uh, and one is that computing eigenvectors on large graphs is just a hard task. Uh, it doesn't scale up very well. And this helps with it. Uh, but the main problem that we re really want to tackle in this talk, uh, which is a bit more topological in nature, is there's eigenvector instability when eigenvalues cluster. Okay, this is true in general. Uh, and for the Laplacian, this shows up anytime there's any kind of s approximate symmetry in our data set. Okay, and so we'll be looking at a lot of very symmetric data sets later on. All right. So first thing is, how am I building these multi-scale graphs? Right? I've got a single data set that I want to analyze, but I'm going to look at it in different snapshots where I go from very, very coarse to much finer viewpoints of the data set. Uh, so initially, and this is a very typical thing to do uh, when we're dealing with topological space, they we're just going to cover our data set with a bunch of sets. Okay? Uh, in practice, these are all going to be the same size set in the space. Uh, and then we're going to look at the nerve of this cover, which just means I'm going to draw edges whenever two subsets intersect. Right? All right, and we're going to weight edges according to how much they overlap. All right, so that's kind of a single layer, right? But I want to look at different snapshots. Uh, and so I'm going to refine this cover over and over. Uh, and that just means I'm going to look at a collection of subsets that cover the data set that are smaller and contained inside of. Uh, some set and the coarser cover. Okay. Uh, so generally, right when I do this refinement process, I'm going to have more sets, okay, and then more sets, and then more sets. Um, uh, and the last bullet point there is very important: uh, is that this refinement naturally gives us a simplicial map, uh, and that's literally just the fact that I can put sets inside of other sets. Okay, that gives me a simplicial map. Okay. It's like a decomposition of our graphs. All right, so we do this repeatedly to get a tower of covers. I'm going to show you some examples in a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to use these simplicial maps uh, to approximately relate the eigenvectors. So in persistent homology, uh, you can use these kinds of maps to relate your homology generators precisely. Right? You don't have any kind of approximation there. Uh, but when we're dealing with Laplacian eigenvectors, this is no longer precise, it's, or it's approximate. Okay, and that's a lot of what I'll be dealing with today is how do you deal with this approximation? Uh, so this is handled in the background using collapsing of graphs uh, and showing that I have equivalent uh, linear algebra problems. All right. So as I said, our strategy is just to use these simplicial maps uh, and I'm going to use them to define consistent basis functions from one layer to the next. All right. So that's kind of the general point of view. Uh, but there's two specific ways we're going to build these cover towers. 
Uh, one is cover trees, and the other is matter, right? Uh, so cover trees just provide covers very naturally uh, for a data set at multiple resolutions. They originally were used for uh, speeding up nearest neighbor queries and things like that, and that's not what we're dealing with here. Okay, the nice, one of the nice things about the cover tree is they just give us these parent-child relationships. So they give us the simplicial maps between uh, all of our complexes. Uh, so this is a nice little example of building a cover tree. You just start with a single node in red there uh, and a cover, and you choose children iteratively, reducing my radius. <coughs> Out of this kind of choices, I get a nice little graph here. Uh, and so you can see very, very clearly that parent-child relationship as I go down the graph, right? Uh, so any particular layer there uh, is what I'm looking at for a particular cover. All right. Uh, and the second way we're going to be building these graphs is by a mapper. Uh, so it's a wonderful tool in TDA that y'all heard from um, Gunnar Carlson earlier. And I've used the data set as a graph. I've got a very similar picture of a circle there. Uh, but remember, we don't just want to use map at once. I want to do this at different resolutions, right? Uh, so what I've basically got down there is using mapper with four cover sets and eight cover sets. Uh, and so when you pull out back your covers into the clusters, um, the hope is that I can relate to these two graphs. Right. So these are the graphs we get out of Mapper in this little toy example. Uh, and so we can actually get the hexagon on the left and kind of this winged uh, octagon, decagon on the right. Uh, and the idea is that I have a relationship here where these little wings get mapped to the bottom, these two will get mapped to the right, these two will get mapped to the right, and so I have relationship between these two graphs, okay? Uh, and that means I have a relationship not just between the two graphs, but between um, vectors built on the vertices, the edges, so on and so forth, right? So I've got a little bit of detail on how we're defining the weights on our, on our graphs to define these Laplacians. Uh, so for cover trees, I've got this kind of usual kernel-based piece on the right here, that's this positive part of distance. Uh, but those two pieces on the left, p inverse of x, p inverse of y, okay, when I have two cover sets and layers, I want to see how much data is in each of those cover sets, and I'm using that to weight the, the uh, edges. So the reason is that um, when you deal with these Laplacians at different levels, if I actually want to relate these eigenvectors appropriately, I need to be careful about how I'm defining the Laplacians. Okay. Uh, so for cover trees, that's how I do it. For mapper, uh, I don't have quite as much specificity with my cover sets, so I'm just using the intersection size directly. All right. Um, so it's great that I've got a whole lot of graphs, uh, and I can relate the linear algebra, but I'd really like to be able to view them um, and so I've got all these eigenvectors defined in different spaces, right? I've got maybe an eigenvector, an R4 eigenvector is an R8. I want to relate them visually. Uh, and so one way to do that for you guys so you can see what's going on behind the scenes uh, is to use a nerve mapping. Uh, this is why using cover sets is so convenient here, <coughs> besides the refinement properties, uh, is that I can cover a data set with a, a bunch of sets, uh, weight, draw weight functions on each of these sets, uh, and normalize them and get a nerve map. So that's mapping directly into the simplicial complex. Um, and the convenient part about these nerve maps is that I induce mappings back from uh, the simplicial complex to the data set. And so regardless of if I have seven covers or 20 covers or a thousand covers, the eigenvector I get here, it's got the same space, right? I'm looking on the data set itself. Okay, so that'll be helpful to relate everything. All right, so all of this machinery is built to trace eigenvectors as I go down this whole ladder of covers. 
Uh, so there's two things that we do. One is what I call first cascade. Uh, and this is just taking eigenvectors, pushing them forward with these uh, <coughs> parent functions, or simplicial maps, if you like. Right? And I'm just using that to give initial guesses on eigenvector determination. So there's a lot of iterative methods, Lanchos, uh, LOB, PCG, that just iteratively compute eigenvectors. Uh, so this is kind of just a happy accident, but this speeds up calculation uh, sometimes quite a bit. Uh, but really the goal of the project right, is that we want to iteratively project initial guesses onto the new eigenspaces. Uh, so what does this mean? So, so we have, uh, let's say, clustered eigenvalues at one level, right? And cluster eigenvalues at another level, and eigenvectors associated to them, but they may be rotated from one level to the next. Uh, and so what I'm doing is I'm finding the actual eigenvectors at each level, and then I'm projecting the guesses at the course level onto the eigenspace, not the individual eigenvectors. And so I've got maybe a two or three dimensional eigenspace uh, corresponding to these clustered eigenvalues. Okay, so I'll show you guys some pictures of this happening real soon. Uh, and then at the bottom here, I just wanted to show you guys a little bit clearer motivation for this, where you've got three uh, matrices just in R2, uh, and these are all arbitrarily close. I'm just using epsilon to tell the difference between them. Can be arbitrarily small, uh, and the eigenvectors for these three matrices can rotate all the way around. Okay, they can be one zero and zero and one, or they can be uh, one one and one negative one. And so it's very very unstable. Okay, that's be because the eigenvalues are very very close to one in all of these cases, okay, so they're clustered together. So that's why we need second cascade to relate these bases. All right. So that's just a little view of the speed up we get on some different uh, data sets. Uh, so in particular, I think the Cantor and Carpet data sets are interesting uh, because I'm building these data sets to look like fractals, uh, which means there's a whole lot of topological information in them. Uh, the Cantor data set has hundreds and hundreds of connected components and the carpet data set has many, many cycles. And so we get, in some cases, an awful lot of speed up, and especially in the Cantor data set, uh, where once I've got a connected component at one scale, it stays. Okay. Right. So this is kind of the bottom line of the whole, the whole deal. <clears throat> So uh, these, this is an example of a data set where I've just kind of got this pinwheel shape. And I'm looking at the Laplacian eigenvectors at different scales. Uh, and this is just the first six eigenvectors plotted in color. Uh, and then going from a coarse to a medium to a fine covering. Uh, and so on the top, I'm not doing any kind of projection. This is just finding the eigenvectors at each scale. Uh, due to the symmetry, there's not really any correspondences here from level to level. Okay? Uh, and not just flipping, but just rotating within spaces. Okay? And this gets harder and harder to track as you have higher dimensional spaces, higher dimensional clustered eigen spaces. And on the bottom there, when we do this projection step, okay, perhaps unsurprisingly given what we're doing, uh, but we just get very easy to to relate uh, eigenvectors. So that's very useful for um, anything where you want to relate levels, but in particular for visualization, if I want to have a consistent visualization. <clears throat> so the other example I want to share with you guys is Mapper. Uh, so this is actually the same data set of high contrast image patches. Uh, so I've cited the original source of the data, it's the same Mumford sort of data set that uh, Ben introduced. And we have another picture of that Klein bottle topology and the three circle, it's not shown up too well on there <coughs> for whatever reason. <coughs> and so I'm just cutting Macker's filter function at eight intervals from 18 intervals. 
Uh, and coloring by the first few eigenvectors. Yeah, that's the last slide. Yeah. Okay. Let's yeah. take a couple, another minute to summarize. All right. Uh, so basically, the deal here is that these visualizations of the macrographs, since this is a bit more complex of a macrograph with all these tendrils shooting out, uh, is there's not any clear way to relate all of these different features from one scale to the next. Uh, but as it turns out, and I've gone and checked this out quite deliberately, but these colorings across scale are very, very consistent. Yeah, they represent exactly the same regions of the data set. Uh, so if you were to use these eigenvectors, specifically derived here for visualization, you would have the same picture throughout the entire uh, scale. Okay. So I'll just list them. Yeah, we'll let you finish. Okay. So conclusions, cascading makes for faster eigenvector determination, uh, and it allows us to have consistent bases to view uh, this view our data set at different scales. We've got a few future directions. First, we wanted to prove stability and regularity for cascading, and we've actually already done this. Okay. Um, and then the notion of persistent Laplacian eigenvectors, and there's some issues with dealing with a continuous variable and properly assigning eigenvectors across uh, different uh, parameters, because things get messy when eigenvalues move across each other. Uh, and then we've got some ideas for matching and interleaving of the eigenspaces to kind of formalize what we mean by persistent Laplacian eigenvectors. Um, yeah, and an application to the evolution of language. That's it, thank you. Right, thanks. Thank you. We have time for maybe one or two questions. Does anybody have a question? Chris. Hey, yeah, this is amazing. I was always hoping somebody would do kind of persistent thing with, with spectral clustering. Mm -hmm. um, just to be clear, so the first level, you still do choose an arbitrary basis, whatever it is, whatever comes out of the classroom. It's just a consistent choice throughout the levels. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's correct. Um, so where exactly you choose your basis, I think, is something that could use its own um, organization. But you're right, it's kind of the coarsest level where you initially choose these eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Uh, and assigning in order. Yeah, that's why there's a lot here about actually tracking eigenvectors that I want to look into. So we can actually like not just keep the same order uh, because as I've shown on here, it just listed like one to six, for example, and the actual ordering of the eigenvalues may not correspond to the proper <laughs> correspondence of eigenvectors. It, it generally does here because of the way I'm doing uh, course defined. Yeah. One more question. Oh, okay, let's thank our speaker.